It's 6 p.m. Indian Standard Time. Good evening, everyone. It's so good to see you all. And as uh, we keep up with this tradition, jump to trade, welcome everyone, dear fam. Uh, I know it's going to be a really odd uh, community call uh, team talk session because I guess a lot of you will be surprised to see Aradhya among the audience and uh, this is one of the very few instances where you will see Aradhya in the audience. It's going to be uh, a very like odd experience for you all and uh, it's it's great to have you all here. Uh, for any uh, team talk, uh, one of the greatest indicators of enthusiasm is the number of people who join ahead of time and it's so good to see you all here uh, at least five to ten minutes ahead of uh, the talk and uh, so we are going to have a really interesting conversation that I think is the need of the AR because uh, NFTs they are going through a multifaceted revolution in India on one side they are being adopted um, by a lot of people, it's garnering it's garnering uh, a lot of recognition. And parallel to this, we are also looking at uh, NFTs uh, getting their legal recognition as well. And when we talk about legal recognition, we also need to understand that there are a few repercussions. And uh, to discuss this topic, we have the most deserving and the most fitting people. So on one side, we, we have Mr. Hamant. He's a partner uh, in corporate mergers and acquisitions practice at uh, Lakshmi Kumaran Sridharan uh, legal firm. And uh, it's one of the most renowned legal firms in South India. And uh, he has a wide uh, gamut of experience spreading across so uh, cross-border funds, uh, investments, acquisitions, joint ventures and commercial contracts. And he also has uh, a very deep focus into the area of virtual digital assets, which is pretty much uh, NFTs, IT, IT enabled services and a lot of things like that. He also provides strategy consulting and um, he is also involved in advising a lot of foreign exchange regulations and securities and corporate matters and like even tech related issues. So basically he is a legal tech entrepreneur and uh, he can bring a lot of clarity on the uh, legal front with respect to NFTs and virtual digital assets at large. And uh, let us all admit it, one of the biggest uh, um, offsets or one of the biggest effects of uh, legality lies in the financial side of things, right? So uh, any any legal lapses will let it will lead to some uh, financial uh, reparations that need to be paid. So I think it's only good that we have someone with a very deep uh, finance background. And uh, on the finance side, we have uh, Mr. Harish Ayer, uh, the Chief Financial Officer of Guardian Link. So uh, he will uh, give um, a lot of um, insights on the. Uh, on the financial front. Uh, he is an MBA from Manchester and he also uh, has worked with a lot of globally renowned organizations like Shell. And right now uh, he's been uh, uh, in the, he, he's in the process of giving Guardian Link the much needed uh, fine edge uh, when it comes to taking on this uh, legal side of things uh, in the NFT space. And uh, a conversation between both of them is going to be not only uh, interesting and intriguing, but also informative. So let us leave the flow to these uh, two geniuses in their own regards. Uh, over to you, Harish. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, I mean, what you have said is absolutely right. I think a discussion on this topic is, I think, uh, much awaited, right, by almost everyone. Uh, the laws are ever evolving. I mean, it's very fluid. And I think Hemant uh, will shed a lot of light on some of the issues that uh, companies like ours face, as well as, uh, uh, I mean, discuss some of the issues with related to the users of the platform and, 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 and how all these laws uh, affect them on a day-to-day -day basis when they do trades with NFTs and crypto. Uh, and also we'll, we'll run through some of the uh, general legislation around cryptocurrencies, not only in India, but globally how uh, most governments are approaching them. Uh, obviously, the focus will be on India because that is where a lot of you are. 
but uh, we will try and bring in some other uh, views as well uh, from other governments and how other countries are addressing crypto and nfts right uh, himant uh, uh, good to go sure harish thank you and uh, uh, the introduction was so kind that i hope the expectations are not so high that i will uh, end up disappointing the room uh, i'll try to do my best <laughs> um just a couple of things to clarify up front uh, given that i'm a lawyer it's my duty to clarify that this is going to be more like an exploratory chat we are going to uh, you know discuss things that hopefully everyone in this room uh, is interested in and uh, uh, what i say during this chat should not be considered on legal advice yeah arish that is right good to go okay uh let's get started uh, uh, so the first question to you hemant is uh what do you think is the place of cryptocurrencies uh, in the eyes of the law today yeah so um harish so i mean uh, there is really no simple answer to that question um especially when we ask what the legality of cryptocurrencies is uh, you know it's a bit of a rainbow and there are countries at the extreme ends of the legality spectrum on the one hand you have countries like russia where i understand that the president recently signed a new bill into law that bans vendors of goods and services from accepting payments in crypto and nfts um on the other hand there are also countries like portugal and singapore where cryptocurrencies are unambiguously legal um it's just that some of these countries and probably india is somewhere in between uh you know and some of the more liberal crypto friendly countries are better at balancing you know the regulatory imperatives such as preventing money laundering and so on and you know the need to create an innovation friendly environment for emerging technologies and businesses as far as um, india goes uh you know as of now it's a bit of a neither here nor there kind of a situation um there are primarily sort of three questions that pop up when we ask okay where do cryptocurrencies lie um on the whole legal spectrum right first is are cryptocurrencies a currency the way we traditionally think of fiat currency um on this the rbi our central bank's view is very clear in that they just say that look something that's not issued by a central bank that's not issued by the government is not a currency and will not be recognized as a currency and will not qualify as currency uh the exception to that would be uh you know something like a cbdc or a central bank digital currency uh which you know is being touted to be the legal tender that will be issued by the rbi in a digital form where you could sort of exchange uh you know Uh, each cbdc for a uh, regular rupee so it's it's more or less the same as fiat currency um, and you know it's it's expected to be exchangeable one to one with fiat currency so cbdc aside you know rbi stands very clear it's not currency uh, there are good arguments for why it should be considered goods for the purpose of you know laws like the foreign exchange laws um but cryptocurrencies have many characteristics that uh, don't really match with those of traditional goods uh, including let's say software right because um <clears throat> sort of the primary use case that we look at when we look at cryptocurrencies their use in payments and you know transactional application that's that's not really how um you know goods have traditionally been treated um you know when laws like foreign exchange laws have been framed the third question is so then are they securities right like shares and debentures and so on so generally even the answer to that is a no because when a company begins to you know let's say raise funds from um public and confers shareholder like rights on them uh, you know one is compelled to think you know why are cryptocurrencies not securities um well the fact is that uh, you know while <clears throat> icos are one way uh, in which cryptocurrencies are used um you know there are a whole lot of other uh, things that come with securities you know uh, what a company can do to raise uh, you know to issue shares to the public uh, to a private group of persons and so on and the corporate laws of the uh, of you know common law countries or otherwise have not really contemplated situations like icos when they frame the corporate laws and uh, as of now you know the way 
shares are traded on stock exchanges that are controlled by securities market regulators. There's really no regulator that can uh, have that kind of a grip over exchanges that allow trade in cryptocurrency simply because they're primarily, you know, cross-border and anonymous uh, by nature. So as a result of all of, of course, there could be other questions like, you know, uh, are cryptocurrencies prepaid instruments? Are they intellectual property rights, especially things like NFTs? Um, you know, but you could sort of go and uh, go on discussing uh, till the cows come home, whether they are one thing or the other. The fact of the matter is all these concepts have evolved at a time when cryptocurrencies and NFTs were not really the top of mind uh, concern for legislators. And therefore, they really uh, exist in a regulatory vacuum. Um, as far as, you know, Indian government's specific tryst with regulating and governing cryptocurrencies are concerned, I think most of us have, uh, uh, you know, became aware of the RBI stance only in 2018 April, when the RBI issued a directive to banks to withhold banking facilities to crypto players. But the fact is that the RBI had been uh, very vocal from um, as far back as 2013 about uh, virtual currencies being, um, uh, you know, potentially rife with economic risks and financial risks and so on. Um, of course, you know, uh, in the very famous challenge that the IMEI, the Internet and Mobile Association of India threw to the circular that the RBI issued uh, for withholding banking facilities, our Supreme Court sort of read down that circular and said it's inconsistent with what in legal terms we call the doctrine of proportionality in that if you're bringing a measure that curbs the rights of certain persons, does it really have a rational connection with the objective behind that measure? And is that measure important enough to be taken? And, you know, is there perhaps a less intrusive measure that you can take to achieve the same objective? And in the view of the Supreme Court, you know, the uh, circular that the RBI issued and uh, the sort of indirect ban that it resulted in uh, was very excessive and disproportionate to the sort of curbs that the RBI ought, uh, you know, sought to achieve uh, through that circular. So it read it down and um, of course, the RBI's stance on cryptocurrencies and virtual digital assets, however, remains unchanged. Uh, you know, it is from time to time urged our government to consider reintroducing a ban on private cryptocurrencies. Of course, uh, it is time and again confirmed that uh, later this year, we are going to perhaps see the central bank digital currency, that's the CBDC. Um, in fact, as recently as uh, May last year, the RBI issued another advisory to banks and payment system providers, um, which urged them to carry out customer due diligence for transactions in virtual currencies. Uh, you know, this is in line with uh, the RBI's general regulations on know your customer, anti-money laundering, combating uh, financing of terrorism and, uh, you know, PMLA related restrictions that exist for, uh, you know, typical payment systems. Um, there is, of course, uh, you know, something that's probably not very well known is that the Indian government last year had sought to introduce a bill called the Cryptocurrency and Regulation of Official Digital Currency Bill 2021 which sought to prohibit all private cryptocurrencies in India and only allow certain exceptions to it to promote the uh, technology that cryptocurrencies use, which is blockchain technology. Personally, I feel it's a good thing that this bill has not seen the light of day because virtual digital assets need a far more nuanced framework than like an all out ban. Um, of course, the government's move to tax the gains from crypto transactions earlier this year caused many to believe that uh, the government will follow it up with legislation that legalizes cryptocurrencies. Um, that is clearly not to be, uh, at least so far. So on the whole, the government's stance has been oscillating quite a bit. So um, what I would say is that, uh, you know, we have to keep uh, uh, abreast of the finance minister's cues and the government's general cues. Uh, from time to time, as well as, you know, what the RBI and the SEBI are telling the government and uh, what they're saying in their speeches and so on. And uh, just, you know, to get a best uh, clue about how regulation will shape up in due course. The finance minister mentioned, uh, you know, recently that uh, she would like to see an international collaboration for this, because by the very nature, it's very difficult for a government in isolation to regulate. 
Thanks, Hemant. I mean, uh, what you have said, I think, is uh, my mind is not only in India, but I think other jurisdictions as well. Uh, I think even the U.S. is struggling. Uh, if I can take an example of the U.S. is, is struggling with some of these issues, right? Uh, I was recently uh, listening to one of the video conversations from the CEO of Ripple, where he mentioned that I mean they have been sued because they issued a currency and that has been taken as a security by uh, by the regulator there. So I think uh, I think in almost all countries, uh, in some form or the other, there is. Uh, there's a bit of, uh, I mean, it's all a bit, a bit fluid in the sense that uh, regulation is still to evolve. And like you mentioned, it has to be a bit more nuanced in, in how they approached approach the whole issue, especially when uh, this technology, from what I can see, I think is going to be the industrial revolution number four, right? Uh, I mean, in every sense, it looks like this is going to stay. So, uh, Absolutely, Harish. I couldn't agree more. Um, the fact of the matter is, you know, when uh, the idea of the stock exchange came up, and I think uh, the world's first ever stock exchange was uh, something that got set up as a commodity exchange, actually in Amsterdam, and uh, you know, in uh, sometime in the 18th century, and uh, definitely there was no regulation to govern it, um, and invariably evolution outpaces legislation uh, that's that's how uh, it has been through the course of history so i think um, you know it would it would serve everyone well if regulators sort of warmed up to the advantages and you know uh, only really you know try to target what are the disadvantages that need to be curbed and uh, try to understand it uh, with the kind of nuance that that it really uh, deserves so, so my next question to you is around NFTs. I think NFTs obviously uh, are, are based on the same technology, and and in the eyes of the Indian law, to some extent, uh, it's it's been you know painted with the same brush uh, of crypto, right? Uh, what do you think? All that you have said holds true for NFTs as well, especially uh, given the use cases uh, with NFTs. I think they are a lot different than crypto. Uh, and I think, uh, if, for example, in our gaming platform, there's a, the use case, uh, there's a proper use case for NFTs, right? People can actually game, they can earn points, they can uh, get fiat for it. Absolutely. So there's a real use case for the for the for the NFT as compared to a, just a cryptocurrency, right? Uh, how, what Absolutely. is your opinion on, on NFTs? Yeah, that's a great question, Harish. So, um, quite honestly, uh, you know, given the fact that uh, you know regulators are only as recently as you know maybe a year ago, a couple of years ago, four years ago, uh, began to talk about virtual digital assets as an asset class. Um, as of now, there clearly doesn't exist a very uh, fine distinction between you know fungible cryptocurrency and you know NFTs. Um, the sort of uh, like you said, uh, you know, brushed under the same carpet of uh, virtual digital assets or cryptocurrencies and so on. Um, while technically, you know, they do rely on similar technology, uh, you know, blockchain and uh, cryptography and so on. Um, the fact is, uh, my own view is that unlike fungible tokens, NFTs not only have a store of value, but they also have an artistic value and an artistic value that's quite different and distinguishable uh, from just traditional art. Um, you know, it's, so it's important to understand that in, uh, you know, so what, how is it different from other cryptocurrencies? And if there is any um, regulation uh, in the future, it should give sufficient weightage to the different and fairly distinct use cases that NFTs have um, in contrast to um, other cryptocurrencies. You know, to just give you an example, uh, you know, take the example of um, Guardian Link uh, alone, right? So NFTs have seen so much traction in the gaming world. Um, you know, they're used as uh, uh, costumes and weapons and sports equipment and so on. And, um, you know, it's it's been deployed uh, to such exciting ends of in the play to earn gaming models, for example. So in that context, the key is to ask whether the NFTs are really altering the fundamental nature of the game, uh, you know, from let's say a game of skill to a pure game of chance, or, you know, are they not? Are they in fact, let's say, uh, enhancing um, or reinforcing the nature of a game uh, as a game of skill? Because by and large, uh, you know, as far as the gaming context goes, the legislation in India uh, 
uh, you know, for gaming varies from state to state, but the bulk of the states regulate it based on the simple test of whether a game is a game of skill or a game of chance. So, you know, so long as NFTs are not altering that, um, you know, just use of NFTs uh, in the gaming context um, should not, uh, you know, attract any special regulatory treatment. Um, likewise, NFTs are probably being um, used as a very powerful brand engagement tool and that's only going to, um, you know, increase further uh, as a trend, right? Um, in a fairly short span of time, if, uh, the sheer number of ways in which companies have used it to deepen customer relationships uh, is is honestly astounding. You know, I mean, if if Suresh is more loyal a Burger King customer than Ramesh, there is no reason why Suresh should not receive uh, a more favorable treatment from Burger King, right? Uh, and I think NFTs truly offer uh, new doors, you know, for brands to offer perks to their most valuable customers. Um, not just that, you know, let's say for musicians to interact more closely with their more diehard fans um, and, you know, artists to offer privileges to those who've actually offered them support, uh, let's say in their early days. So um, in this context, of course, uh, you know, the legislation that otherwise um, would work a little differently with NFTs would probably be consumer protection legislations. Uh, right. Likewise, um, you know, how things are advertised, there would be advertising guidelines that would be applicable. So uh, NFTs would require a slightly different approach when it comes to advertising regulations. Um, likewise, you know, the small print is very important. Um, uh, you know, when somebody is buying NFT, they have to be very clear as to what is it that they are acquiring. And, um, uh, you know, so long as uh, that is clear, you know, the IP concepts like patents and trademarks, they also come uh, into the picture. So legally speaking, while the base technology is the same and is not radically different for NFTs, uh, because the varied use cases, like you pointed out, the regulation of NFTs will require a lot more nuance. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Hemant, right? Uh, now, I mean, if you look at the Indian, uh, in the Indian context, uh, end of June, we had new tax legislation and I would say a bit of clarity that came out after the finance bill announced taxing of uh, taxation of crypto, right? And and I think they, they've came, come out with some very clear guidelines on uh, what is NFT as per the income tax law, what can and should be taxed and so on. Yeah. Uh, what do you think is the, uh, I mean, it would be good if you can, in, from your point of view, tell the users what the implications are for them. Uh, right. That's something, things that they need to be familiar with. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, quite honestly, you know, there is a, there is a lot of complexity to uh, the way the Income Tax and the Finance Act actually treat VDAs and how the taxation regime works. But I'll try to give, you know, a broad overview of how it works. So as uh, uh, most of you know, uh, it was the budget announcement that sort of triggered this whole uh, taxation regime and the Income Tax Act got amended uh, in April of this year. Uh, and, you know, this is for the first time uh, the taxation of gains or income from virtual digital assets was brought forth by the government. So uh, the tax regime doesn't really distinguish uh, between various virtual digital assets. Uh, it broadly refers to virtual digital assets as information or code or number or token that's generated through cryptographic means. I'm again giving a watered down kind of definition, but uh, it's generated through cryptographic means and provides a digital representation of value exchanged. And this may or may not be for any consideration. Um, so that is how the income tax regime sort of envisages uh, virtual digital assets. It also includes uh, NFTs and other digital assets that the government may notify from time to time. Now, the fact is the tax regime is applicable to everyone who is transferring and dealing in virtual digital assets. It doesn't matter whether you're a retail participant or an investor or you're a trader, uh, you know, who just does this as a business. Right? There is a flat income tax rate without any distinction, again, between uh, short term or long term capital gains, uh, which, you know, uh, let's say in the case of uh, shares is different, right? Uh, there's going to be a 30% tax rate uh, on any profits made from transfer of virtual digital assets. Um, it doesn't matter whether the income is business income or investment income. There's also a cess and a surcharge on the tax amount that's uh, applicable to the gains. And uh, the surcharge varies uh, based on taxable income like uh, always. 
Um, some of the things that are to be kept in mind is that even gifts received in the form of virtual digital assets will also be taxed based on their fair market value in most cases. Um, you know, uh, I think it's also important to touch upon uh, what you hinted at, which is, uh, you know, the recent sort of clarification on uh, tax deduction at source, right? So prior to the Finance Act of 2022, there was no real provision for um, what we call withholding tax or TDS, tax reduction and source. So the Finance Act actually brought in the requirement that any person who's responsible for paying consideration for uh, transfer of a VDA. So let's say you and I enter into a transaction where you sell um, you know, a VDA or a virtual digital asset and I pay for it, right? The payer or the buyer is the one who's responsible for deducting tax at source. So the government for this is set a 1% TDS rate. Uh, and as with TDS generally, um, you know, it's um, in a peer to peer transaction. It's fairly straightforward to determine who the buyer is and, um, you know, for them to deduct the TDS and deposit it uh, in the manner, um, you know, that, that's that's required. Uh, but the fact is when um, a transaction in cryptocurrency or virtual digital assets happens, let's say over an exchange, you know, I may not know who is buying. I may not know uh, that you are buying or you may not know that I'm buying. In those cases, if I deduct uh, TDS, you know, how do I deposit it, right? I don't know uh, what your tax residency is. I don't know whether TDS is, is even applicable, right? So um, there were many such situations uh, because, you know, let's say we are not doing a peer-to-peer -peer transaction, we're doing it over an exchange. So there were many such situations where it was quite unclear as to who is responsible for TDS deduction. And um, uh, it had become a bit of a, uh, you know, hall of mirrors, so to speak. So the CDDT, um, CBDT, which is the central board of uh, direct taxes in India, they came out with a circular um, in June, uh, June 22 to be uh, precise this year, uh, which clarified a lot of these issues. And, uh, you know, it clarified who is the party responsible, uh, you know, in cases where uh, it's done through an exchange, uh, they um, clarified that it would be the exchange that will become responsible and uh, what would be the timing of deduction in certain cases where it's not possible uh, to still determine it uh, you know it would uh, you would have to pay the complete tax before you uh, do the transaction itself um, and of course they also clarified situations like where let's say uh, we barter uh, virtual digital assets right let's say you sell a certain amount of et um, ethereum in uh, and i in return give you a certain amount of bitcoin right so what happens in those cases? So these are some of the things that they've clarified. Um, and, you know, generally, because I think a lot of the folks here would also be interested in getting a smattering of um, uh, information on how global tax regimes work. Um, I just want to contrast, you know, what the Indian regime is with the regimes that exist overseas. Um, of course, there are tax havens which do not tax cryptocurrency gains at all. Uh, they are an outlier. But uh, as far as my knowledge goes, uh, you know, the US considers uh, crypto to be property and it has separate tax rates for long term and short term capital gains from crypto. Um, likewise, the taxation regime uh, in the US is very similar to what's applicable for stocks. Uh, Canada, on the other hand, uh, treats it as commodity and uh, UK treats it as capital asset. In either case, you know, uh, income tax is different from capital gains tax. So they'll uh, determine whether you are deriving business income or investment income from crypto. And accordingly, you know, the rates of tax applicable might be different. Um, Germany, interestingly, is a very uh, lenient regime uh, on tax and it only taxes uh, short term uh, trading in crypto. Um, you know, uh, Portugal is an example of a, a you know, very tax friendly uh, uh, jurisdiction for crypto transactions. Profit from crypto transactions are more or less exempt from income tax and capital gains tax altogether. So that's uh, in brief the way the tax regime works. Uh, I'd also like to just point out that, you know, many of the folks on, uh, in this room may be interested in figuring out how the gains they may have from a game uh, would be taxed. Uh, so it's very important to make a note that any prize money that exceeds 10,000 will 10,000 Indian rupees uh, will be subject to TDS deduction. And uh, the rate applicable would be 31.2%. Uh, 
um and it doesn't really matter whether uh, the income overall is uh, taxable or not so um yeah and there's also no uh, scope for any deduction or expenditure that's allowed that's, that's yeah, so add to that what you said himant i think even if in our case even if you're given points and those points are converted or bartered as you said uh, for other nfts uh, we will assume that the points that are given given out are equivalent to a a, a fiat currency right and and to the extent of if that exceeds 10000 it will be taxed at 31.2% as long as you are an indian resident right uh, so i think the users need to be uh, very clear on that and obviously this deduction will be done by by the platform in which case in this case it is us a guardian link uh, jump.trade will do it it will pay the tax to the authorities and you will be given the certificates uh, for all the transactions that have happened first july onwards uh, and i think the users would have experienced the tax deduction on the platform so uh, we will pay the tax and you will get the certificates right uh, i think that's that's really helpful because uh, you know it it uh, would provide uh, clarity and reassurance to a lot of the players and uh, you know uh, it's very important to figure out uh, you know whether the you know uh, service provider with whom somebody is uh, you know gaming is a trusted provider and a legally compliant uh, provider and i think um, it's it's a very encouraging sign that uh you know the industry leaders are uh, you know making it an easy process for the gamers yeah i think this clarification at the end of june has certainly helped like you said i think absolutely it was very nuanced in the sense it clearly called out who should be paying and who should be deducting uh so moving on to the to the next question i have for you hemant uh, uh so when you look at the regulation of crypto and nfts who do you think is the right authority to do it i, I know in india and in, even globally in the us if i take an example i think there's been a discussion on who should be doing it uh, i think the sec wants to play a part i think there's been a pushback saying they should not be the one regulating it and i think we have ha- we are having similar discussions in india as well between rbi and and sebi for instance right uh, what is your view on that absolutely i think that's a billion dollar question now um i mean as uh, as far as the indian context goes uh, you know primarily we have the rbi and the sebi respectively as regulators for the financial sector and the securities market there are of course other regulators for unrelated sectors like food and insurance and so on um but historically in india the rbi has shown a far greater concern about vdas and it has been a lot more proactive in attempting to regulate it um with varying degrees of success but um the sebi on the other hand honestly believes that it's not the best suited regulator um because you know uh, it believes that different regulators have their own strengths and weaknesses and uh, given the sheer um characteristics and character traits of uh, virtual digital assets as an asset class it believes that a more bespoke regulator for this sectors uh, is better and it's advised the government and there's a parliamentary standing committee uh, which sought some advice from the sebi and the sebi is given a representation to this effect as well um of course it believes that consumers have to be protected under consumer protection act and so on so um but of course nonetheless there have been reports from time to time which um, which have uh, you know speculated about whether sebi is more suited uh given that it's been the securities market regulator and it has some level of insight into how exchanges function and so on uh my own view honestly is the is that you know uh, a vda regulator a bespoke regulator with significantly different capabilities as compared to a traditional uh, securities market or a financial sector regulator would be the ideal one to regulate um, this asset class um simply because you know uh, the vdas rely will will require the regulator to have a uh, to have a thorough understanding of you know the technological sophistication of the blockchain the international and cross border nature of crypto transactions and you know the anonymity that sort of inseparable from the whole distributed and decentralized ledger technologies so in my personal view a dedicated regulator who can draw from the experience of sebi and rbi but can still consider vdas with a fresh pair of eyes would be uh, you know the ideal solution i think we'll all wait and see that that comes so quickly uh, i think we really need a quick uh, 
turnaround on the on the regulations a good i think like you said a, a fair minded regulator will be very helpful for the sector as a whole uh, and let's wait and see uh, and as a lawyer who frequently advises emerging technologies how do you think uh, all of this will impact law as you see it uh, in the future yeah i mean um, the way i see it um, you know blockchain as a technology has a really dramatic implications for the legal system uh, you know anyone who has tried to let's say buy property in india will acknowledge immediately uh, the advantages of deploying a blockchain technology that records ownership let's say on a you know on a shared immutable ledger right similarly uh, in the banking transaction i think uh, blockchain and defi can make transactions a lot cheaper more secure transparent efficient because the whole concept of a trustless uh, ledger system that that underlies the whole technology of blockchain right uh, similarly you know as a uh, you know commercial lawyer a lot of my work goes into drafting contracts and i i honestly think that smart contracts can substitute a lot of the aspects that traditional contracts currently do um, except that you know they can perhaps do it with greater efficiency and more certainty in terms of performance by parties and indemnities um let's say um you know today you and i have a contract and there is a breach by one party the other one would have to sort of run from pillar to post either to an arbitrator or a court you know trying to get um, a specific performance or an injunction or claim uh, damages or indemnity and so on i think to the extent that there is a technological solution to it a smart contract might just be able to um, you know reverse a particular transaction and ensure that uh, you know any breach of contract is uh, disincentivized so the sheer let's say you know in the same breath i'd say that the sheer range of possibilities that things like icos offer to companies uh, when it comes to fundraising um, i think is 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 very inspiring uh, the whole concept of sharing profit which is always been uh, you know sharing profit with shareholders and investors now can be extended to you know customers who i think are an important stakeholders in any uh, you know company uh, right um, so i think that can completely change uh, the contours of corporate law um, as it currently functions um, likewise you know uh, things like daos and uh, decentralized autonomous organizations offer uh, remarkable possibilities uh, like crowdfunding Uh, where you're able to raise source, uh, you know, funds from anonymous sources. Uh, it's, it's simply not possible, even you know, with the advent of uh, internet as uh, traditional internet as we know it. Uh, right. Likewise, I think NFTs offer tremendous hope, um, you know, to artists. When I say artists, I don't just mean uh, you know traditional artists, but I also mean designers. uh the ones who design games the ones who design uh, applications and you know other forms of media uh, musicians you know who for long have been kept off the gravy train uh, by publishers and record labels and so on so i think um it's going to be a very very interesting uh, future that that we are going to enter soon um if cryptos and nfts are given the chance that they deserve i think the possibilities appear to be endless i mean just based on what you have been uh, speaking of now and 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 i think it's scary for a lot of the regulators and i think that is the reason we are seeing all this pushback both from the rbi and a lot of other regulators all over the world i think i think uh, this literally democrat democratizes the entire uh, concept uh, i mean what concepts we have been used to right i mean having a central bank in between is probably no longer a necessity uh i mean any kind of transaction probably can be automated uh i mean the potential is just endless and i think we are just getting started with this technology uh uh and the and the play to earn concept i hope will certainly grow it will add a lot more vigor and i i certainly hope to see a lot more regulation that uh, regulation evolves to support all that we are trying to do right uh we need to be more arish um all that we need to remember is ultimately uh, you know crypto and nfts and blockchain are not a magic pill that will let you uh, you know take a holiday from reality whenever you like and come back without a headache to uh, to quote from uh, you know the brave new world 
but it's a technology that's that's so powerful that it could change the world in ways that we can't imagine today and all said and done you know if the official birthday of the internet is supposed to have been january 1st 1983 uh, the internet is not even 40 years old uh, and you know we all know how it changed the world well uh, let's wait and see how all of this goes uh Himan, I think uh, uh, this has been a very, very interesting conversation, and and I think we are all lucky to get all the insights from you, uh, especially from a legal standpoint. Uh, I mean, we'll certainly have you back one of these days once we have an update from the government on what else is going on, uh, and hopefully you can sort sort of give us a clear understanding of how the law needs to be interpreted in India, right? So, uh, thank you for joining us today. It has been a, a really great, great conversation. Uh, Thank Lovely you so time. much, Harish. The pleasure is all mine. Thank you to all the audience, and I hope to meet all of you either in the metaverse okay. or in real life. Okay, uh, Harish and Hemant, I think it's kind of you know uh, good if you can reserve the thanking part for me because like I think it's been a great pleasure to have you both, and uh, the conversation was. Uh, as uh, we had all predicted quite informative and intellectual i think we are at this juncture when uh, you know like the the enthusiasm to play the mcl is at an all time high and uh, people uh, who are so supportive of our platform should not be lost in uh, legal uncertainty and uh, lack of clarity with respect to how um, the future course of regulations would be and uh, i think it's like uh, it's it's a much needed discussion and uh, hemad the kind of uh, information and the kind of relevance you brought to this conversation it was really wonderful and uh, harish your questions were like perfectly crafted and bringing out the best sort of information and you know like for the lack of better words it was like really good in digging the intellectual depth of hemant with respect to this particular uh, subject matter in getting the best out and when people who are so uh, rooted in uh, the traditional side of finance and uh, the legal side when they come to uh, witness the uh, the new possibilities that blockchain can bring and when they can so openly endorse that Uh, you know that um, that it's it's a good thing for the future and at the same time also balance it out telling that it's not a magic pill i think we are looking at a very uh, balanced and we are looking at a very regulated and a very clear cut future like when people in this uh, level say that you know that blockchain is promising it's as good as virender seva telling that you know a really measured opening batting is like good <laughs> right so yeah it's it's a it's a very good thing thank you thank you hemant thank you harish it was wonderful really wonderful to have you with us and uh, we hope uh, we'll be able to uh, connect again and uh, i know uh, the 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 legal uncertainty kind of keeps you know uh, keeps evading uh, at every stage and at some time when we think we have figured it all out there's something that pops up and we will need some extra legal clarity so i hope like, we we will have more sessions and i really hope our community stays enlightened as much as much as it is engaged and uh, entertained thank you so much himant thank you arish thank you all. thank you thanks bye all right and uh, so now uh, it's time for the community to you know relax a little bit and uh, uh, get things a little light uh, so uh, we have a uh, gamer one who will be joining us uh, sorry for the tense because he has already joined us so hello hello gamer one Hey guys, am I audible? Yes, game over. You are audible. Yeah. So I think we can, you know, like get started. Okay. Hmm. Some kind of a haste. All right. Fine. <laughs> okay. Okay. Game over. So, uh, I just wanted to go through uh, a few uh, questions that uh, we have picked from the community and we and uh, like oh, a lot of other sources. So. Um, The first thing that we will need to ask is uh, give me a moment. So uh, we have been talking a lot about the the rookie specific tournaments, and uh, you had promised us that it's underway. So uh, if something happens for rookie, shouldn't it happen for epics and legends as well? So are we gonna come up with um, tournaments yeah. for other categories? So I think uh, you know, like everyone got the uh, update yesterday. We put we post out you know like a major update of what's going to be coming in the game. 
and you know like rookie tournaments was one of the key highlights there uh you know like speaking more about it uh you know like we want to get started with you know like uh, the rookies we want to see you know understand how you know like uh you know like what will be the uh outcome from that uh experiment and you know like definitely we'll see you know like more category based tournaments happening later down you know like uh in the uh game as we expand but uh for now you know like we small steps first we want to get started with rookie based tournaments only and then gradually you know like upgrade to other categories all right so uh we can safely assume that uh in the future there'll be category specific tournaments that it won't be confined to rookies right yep exactly all right all right so uh gamer one uh i i think uh there's there's uh this is time for something uh really important uh see um uh, i know that you know like cricket is a game of a lot of heat and uh high temperature but that doesn't mean that you know we can't just we can just keep uh going with warm-up matches so uh first of everything why did we have the the warm-up series and then uh, wa- uh when is the warming up going to end and when is the reward going to start yeah so i think i'll take the latter part of your question first you know like when the warm up is going to end so you know like it's a bit bitter sweet you know like when i want to say this you know like it's going to start the rewards the next reward series is going to begin from sunday and you know like uh, we'll be announcing you know like more details on that soon in the meantime you know like why you know like we did why did we take a lot of time you know like to uh, in between tournaments and why was this warm up league you know like uh, very necessary so as you have seen in that update you know which we passed on to the community yesterday uh, we had a lot of you know the like changes come into the game for which a lot of time had to be spent in order to make it you know like uh, uh, a stable you know like a stable version that we could you know like roll out for the community a lot of testing had to be done from our end in the meantime we also had a lot of uh, you know like code being pushed to the server because i think a key a difficulty or a key pain point for a lot of people were uh, you know like the matchmaking as well as you know like in game some glitches so in order to you know like uh, ensure more stabler gameplay for everyone you know like a lot of a uh, time of our developers went into you know like pushing code you know a lot of changes to the server side as well so hence you know like i hope you know the community understands that you know like uh, these things these things do take time and you know like we're working very hard from our end as well you know like to bring the rewards uh, tournaments to you guys soon oh, okay game okay, one got it so uh i i can understand the kind of work that has uh, gone into you know like uh, perfecting the game and uh, giving it the much needed overhaul so um just wanted to know parallel to this uh, so uh, when you're talking about uh, updates to the game so uh, are we looking at uh, any new features or any changes to the reward structure and uh, yeah so uh, uh, what in in what are the updates yeah so you know like we are in this transition phase you know like we want to also experiment different kinds of tournament formats and i think you know like having the rookie versus rookie tournaments you know like uh, we are going to be you know like we're still working on it but we've been pushing it down you know, like down the line but uh, you know like we are also like experimenting this you know like special category based tournaments you know like on the back end so you know like as of now the tournament reward structure will you know like be the same where you you know like participate in leaderboards and you know like climb the leaderboards using leaderboard points but you know like i would like to assure that we are you know like working on different types of formats we're trying to explore different type of competition settings as well uh, you know like but yeah we're getting there okay thank you thank you game of one uh, so uh, now that you have given updates about the game just wanted to know if there are uh, any updates uh, on the marketplace as well so like i i think both of them go hand in hand so uh, is there any uh, any uh, big change of the marketplace that's happening yeah actually you know like if you have visited you know like our uh, you know like a dugout here the developer dugout you know there is a huge whiteboard with a lot of features planned in the pipeline for you know like both the marketplace as well as the game and as far as the marketplace updates go you know like i think we have uh, rolled out uh, you know like level based filters Boy. and we are working on you know like bringing in uh, 
you know many more features uh, down the line all right so uh, i hope the features uh, you know they they reach the community as soon as possible and uh, they i mean like come on uh, our community deserves uh, delights every now and then so um uh, let, let us get into uh, a few uh, nuances of the game so um a, a lot of times uh, before we have been talking about the pitch variations so um and uh, what's the what are the different types of pitches you're planning and uh, how are they expected to change the gameplay like well, we have been talking about how congruent we need to make uh, the mcl uh, with real world experience and uh, pitches are like so important so integral so i think we really need to um, uh, you know like uh, keep the keep the community uh, informed on the pitch types and the strategies that they will need to uh, employ for the different types of um, yeah yeah so you know like as per the uh, you know like the information we shared yesterday i guess you know like uh, people know that you know the three new pitch types are coming to the game uh, you know like for those who do not know like you know like we're going to be having three pitch types coming one is like the dry the other one is the green pitch and the final one is the uh, usual normal pitch and as far as the color scheme goes you know the dry one is you know like you can indicate it by the orange color whereas the green one by the name itself is green going to be like greenish and you know like the normal one is going to be a bit whitish in color you know like you can uh, you can get a very visual you know like distinction between you know like what kind of pitch you're going to be facing uh apart from it you know like uh, just as regular cricket you know like where the pitch is equally important as you know like the teams playing the sport um you know like uh, the pitch type will influence the batting and bowling and you know like a players have to adapt to you know, like to the different uh, condition settings all right so um, i think uh, this is the juncture where uh, the mcl becomes a really strategic game and uh, so now that we are talking yeah. about now that we are talking about strategy one of the things that uh, mcl players need to be aware of is uh, their selection of bowlers with respect to pitches so uh, the bowler selection process and uh, like what to say there are a few changes i believe so what's the uh, what's the change that has happened in the bowler selection process and how is it going to affect the game and the strategic dimension of the game yeah so i think another major you know like uh, update that we had uh, is you know like we're removing that restriction on uh, you know like how many times you can field a particular bowler you know like per over so uh, so uh, especially in uh, teams that had you know like two to three bowlers so they always face this issue that you know like uh, i want to use you know like say i used a bowler a for the first over i cannot use him for the next two overs you know like so that kind of limited uh, the playability of that particular nft so we want to you know like remove that restriction and also this brings in you know like more room for strategy as well and also this in conjunction with the type of pitches that we have so what this does is you know like if uh, say you have a spin bowler you know like a playing on a dry pitch and you know like you have this edge against the opponent batsman so you know like you uh, you know you can continue fielding the same bowler and you know like continue having that advantage as well so it's more of you know like uh, uh, fine tuning the strategy element to it uh, especially given that you know like uh, you can only like uh, as the player can only like simulate the bowler action so this kind of gives it more control to the players and that's that's really fantastic you know it it reminds me of one of those matches where don bradman was captaining the australian side and he made the batsman go in reverse order the last one first because the pitch was like really wet and by the time the pitch was dry uh, the the established batsmen were facing the ball uh, facing the tired bowling attack so uh, i think cricket is a game of strategies more than just skill alone and uh, i think this particular move is uh, yeah, this particular move is good especially uh, when it comes to test cricket like you know we have the Uh, we ha- we have had the red ball and now for the night matches we have had the pink ball thing as well and the way it seems and the way it uh, swings is completely different and it has bamboozled even a lot of uh, uh, 
experienced players uh, going on those lines so uh, the night mode is uh, coming up right so uh, what's what's going to be the uh, the the night mode magic and how how is it going to change the game the gameplay and things like those yeah so you know like i'm uh, you know like you know, there's there's you know like a certain charm to you know like playing uh, you know like matches in the night you know like it's more of a you know kind of a fine dining kind of experience you know like where you go to this low lit uh, restaurants and what not but you know like overall over here it's going to be more of you know like a very visual experience you know like uh, playing in a flood lit stadium and what not and you know like uh, i think uh, users will be able to uh you know like uh take that excitement for the game you know like up a notch and uh you know like experience a new gameplay in itself okay so um i am personally a fan of uh, day and night matches as well because uh, of the dew settings and how light might affect uh, the visibility of the ball and um how certain uh, certain uh, magical bowlers triumph in those kind of uh, environments and uh, your uh, this thing uh, your capacity to hit tournaments i mean your capacity to hit sixes will also drastically change and uh, so uh, with respect to counting sixes so uh, will the previous sixes be, uh, how how is the entire calculation with regards to the count with regards to the distance and uh, the the rewards entailing them how does it function yeah so uh as you know you know like we have been already counting sixes but you know like we're going to be taking it up a notch by you know like also uh you know like clubbing it with the new feature that we're rolling out which is we're going to be calculating the distance of the sixes as well so you know like uh, this adds in you know like another kind of side game kind of quest challenge which uh, challenge you know like uh, people can try to you know like uh, create a record breaking six within the game and uh, even though it's too early right now to discuss the rewards but we are exploring options uh, later you know like much much later that you know uh, how we can maybe have like a hall of fame for you know uh, you know like the top 10 sixes or you know like how uh, the traditional cricket as well has this uh, 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 kind of yeah, uh, honor boards honor honor boards yeah. like the lords honor yeah. board yeah yeah Yes, yes, gamer. Continue. I was just giving an example of uh, the honor boards. That's it. Continue. Yeah. Apart from it, uh, uh, if uh, you were inclined to know, like how we calculate the distance, uh, yes. so the team has been able to build a kind of game logic that uh, will you know, uh, will kind of you know like uh, calculate the distance based on you know like the stadium sides. Uh, like if you hit on the west side, will have a different length as well as the east side, and you know like all the different the four directions of stadiums. So it's going to be quite interesting, you know, uh, to see you know like how players you know like uh, uh, you know like uh, use this particular feature. That's that's really interesting. So sixes they are uh, really special. Uh, although it has become kind of quite common these days because of T Twenty. uh the joy of hitting a six is always there and uh i really like the fact that it's going to be um, it's it's going to be so uh, different and uh, like uh, i think a lot of uh, the cricket enthusiasts in our community would know that the longest ever six was hit by brettley not by someone who would ex- someone who would who you would expect so uh and like what to say there are uh, yeah Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah yeah i think it went 135 uh, meters uh like if you keep that in kilometers per hour that's still less than the bowling speed of brettley on an average anyway so uh let's leave the nuances of cricket let's come into the discussion so um in most cases you know like when when what happens to be uh, a clear six on one side of the boundary might end up getting caught on the other side of the i'm on the other side of the pitch it's it's always uh, a, a thrill to see that and uh, mcl also has these uh, catches and uh, so um there are times when uh, the, the animations of the catch are shown and sometimes they're not so uh, what's the this thing what's the logic behind it and uh, how how does that uh, caught out animation and the feeling animation work yeah so uh 
you know like we have uh, two uh, fielding uh, animations as well as two caught out animations also arriving in the game and uh, these are you know just a subset of a larger series of animation variations that we are uh, you know like planning to bring to the game as we continue to build the game uh and also as far as you know like uh, how often can you see this variations it's you know like completely random as well as uh, also depends on you know like the type of uh, batting shots that you play maybe if you play a loft or you know you play a stroke it's going to be uh, you know like you can never guess what kind of uh, fielding animation you can uh, view but you know like this is more of a stylistic change as well and will bring you know like adds a bit uh, more flavor to the game which i feel okay um uh, that's uh, see when, when when these animations are what i think uh, add that little bit of a garnish to the game experience uh, so uh, the delight uh, or rather the dismay in whatever direction so when you see that uh, uh, a ball is being fielded really well and uh, the the mechanics and the physics of it go uh, in line with how it would be in real world i think it's going to be um really fantastic and uh, uh there are a couple of uh, questions that might not uh, be quite uh, you know like powerful but i think uh, it's it's uh, it's it's important and like come on we are talking about cricket we are talking about uh, a game that had uh that has legends like saurav gangli as much as there are legends like sachin tendulkar i think there should be a left hand control option for the game so um how uh, how is it, how is it going to be configured uh this thing the the left hand controls i mean uh, we have to give room for the south pause even in the mcl right yeah you you exactly correct so uh you know like uh, this this update is you know like very unique as well because uh, this was uh, you know like targeted towards making mcl more accessible as well so uh, you know like we went ahead and tried to uh, you know like uh, make the game more friendly for you know like our, uh left hand gamers as well and in order to like uh, configure this change you know like uh, in the game in case you want a left hand control option so as you know you can simply go to the uh, settings and you can uh, use the uh, you know like can toggle your option over there and uh, you know like the the changes will be implemented immediately that's that's really lovely that's fantastic to hear and uh... yeah i think uh, that's about it and uh, uh, game of one uh, do you have any additional uh, things that you think we need to uh, discuss yeah i think uh, one question that a uh, few people have asked is you know like uh, can you please clear if there's no there's going to be no warm ups in the future which i think santosh kum has asked so you know like santosh kum like definitely we do not want to have warm ups you know like as uh, frequently but the thing is you know like whenever we're working on a very uh, you know like specific update or trying to make you know like uh, changes to the game uh, we would you know like want uh, it's sort of you know like having kind of a maintenance uh, for any usual game so you know like these are very much needed for our developer team as well to give them some breathing space uh, so that you know that they can work on those uh, much need, much needed updates stress free so uh you know like i hope uh, you know like it, uh, the community will be more supportive uh, towards the warm up uh, matches as well because you know that they are as important as the uh, other matches yes yes gamer uh, so uh, santosh uh, just wanted to uh, add a bit to what the gamer has said see uh, like uh, the the mcl also has to uh, go through its uh, uh, its updates and uh, you as a community have been like really enthusiastic and you have been giving us feedback you have been um, requesting features uh, the the flip side of uh, that particular thing uh, the, your features being uh, your request being taken seriously is that the the developer community needs to i mean the developers need to work on it and uh, um uh, this would this would what uh, in most cases as gamers said this would what uh, prompt us to uh, put some uh, this thing some warm up matches yeah 
and i think uh, another question that uh, i think sidik asked was you know like any update on renting uh so you know like sidik i would be you know like uh, excited to tell you that uh, you know like we uh, have you know like we are working with the guild and we're working on making you know like uh, we're going to be creating that functionality and you know like uh, we're working very hard on it uh we were able to you know like uh, recently close on you know like the initial frd doc which you know like lines up what all features should come and what all you know like uh, you know like the pros and cons as well as the feature set and everything else that we need to develop take into account when developing it so you know like uh, we are working hard on bringing this uh, uh, rentals and we are also like uh, working uh, you know like uh, taking you know like inputs from other girls as well thank you thank you thank you gamer i think um, we have uh, i think this this one has been addressed and uh, like uh, it's it's i mean uh, it's interesting to note that uh, the number of people uh, who have been uh, attending the uh, the session on taxation is uh, a lot more than the number of people who have who have been uh, who are participating in this and uh, it's it's really <laughs> I, I, positively interesting, I would say, because like we look at a community that is uh, interested in uh, being compliant. Uh, uh, it's 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 a good it's a really good sign. And uh, so, uh, Gamer One, any other uh, thing that you would like to address? Yeah. So um, yeah, I think uh, you know, like uh, if you guys have any questions about uh, the you know like the new updates and whatnot so you know like always happy to you know like answer those queries in the uh in the, in the uh community so definitely you know like we're looking out for any queries over there all right all right fantastic yeah i think um we have uh come to the close of yet another wonderful session and uh it's uh really awesome to have had uh the community members participate and uh, well, although they're not there, a word of thanks goes out to Harish and Hemant as well for throwing so much light on uh, the the legal stance of uh, virtual digital assets. And uh, uh, another little word of thanks goes to Aradhya who for the first time I think is in the audience section. It was wonderful and uh, we hope to have another lovely uh, team team talk session in the coming week thank you everyone and uh let's yeah. uh, meet again thank you game over yeah wishing you all yeah. a happy week. yeah have a wonderful weekend guys thank you